So very good evening, everyone. Hope you are doing well. In uh, today's session, which is my lecture number eighty-two, we'll be talking about uh, a case-based approach to male hypogonadism. Here, I'll be covering the endocrine society guidelines plus the Lancet uh, twenty twenty-four review of male hypogonadism, which was recently published, uh, covering the details of evaluation and taking into context uh, the endocrine society guidelines as well. So let's start right away. Again, it's a very important session for clinical practice plus our endocrinology exams. So in this lecture, uh, I'll be doing via case-based approach, three sections. First, I'll be looking into how to diagnose male hypogonadism. Secondly, I'll be looking at the treatment of hypogonadism with different types of testosterone uh, replacements. We'll talk about the different formulation, the pros and cons, which one is better, which one is preferred. And also in the last section, we'll be covering about monitoring while on testosterone replacement therapy, including the uh, monitoring which is required like for hematocrit, for PSA, and even in terms of CV risk, prostate cancer, we'll be talking about the latest data and the latest evidence as per the Lancet review plus the endocrine society guidelines. So it will be a comprehensive session covering uh, all these three sections via case-based approach. So let's start with the first section, which is regarding diagnosis of male hypogonadism. So let's start with the case for the first section. So case number one is a 40-year-old male with fatigue and low libido. So 40-year-old male patient presents with progressive fatigue, low libido, difficulty in concentrating over the past six months, he has a BMI of 37, so obesity grade 2, and type 2 diabetes, for which he is currently just taking metformin. Uh, on clinical examination, he has normal secondary sexual characteristics, normal facial and pubic hair. On examining of his testes, by the orchidometer, he, he had a testes size of around 20 cc, which is normal. And on evaluation for gynecomastia, he did have a presence of gynecomastia, which was non-tender on palpation. So when we are looking at the clinical uh, features or the clinical presentation for organic versus functional or late onset hypogonadism, these are the things which we should take into concept, uh, context. Number one is in terms of organic hypogonadism, whether there is an organic cause for the primary or the second hypogonadism, we'll be looking at these causes in the next set of slides. We'll have absent or reduced facial hair. We can have unexplained anemia. So again, a CBC and a hematocrit becomes essential in the initial step of evaluation. There may be through gynecomastia. Uh, even uh, many a times we do a DEXA scan at the baseline because these patients may present with low bone mineral density. They will have a small testes, which is less than 15 ml each testes, and absent or reduced pubic hair. And they may have evidence of low muscle mass. So in this case scenario, we will have truly that the total testosterone level will also be very low. And the free testosterone level also will be very, very low. And in this case scenario, there will be definite benefit from testosterone treatment. Lifestyle may or may not benefit depending upon the cause, but testosterone treatment will definitely be of benefit as can be seen clearly in this picture. Moving on to the other section here, when we talk about functional or late onset hypogonadism, which may not be through hypogonadism, the patient may have a normal facial hair, anemia may be uncommon, there may be adiposity or uh, pseudogynecomastia, what we call it, or non-tender gynecomastia as was present in our clinical case scenario. There'll be central adiposity, there'll be totally a normal bone mineral density, uh, there'll be normal testicular volume and normal pubic hair as well. In this case scenario, even though the total testosterone may appear low, maybe because of the low SHBG as occurs in obese patients, but the free testosterone will be no, low normal or maybe normal as well. In this case scenario, as it's mentioned, testosterone treatment may be of some benefit, but lifestyle changes, exercising, losing weight, will be of definitely great benefit. So when we talk about specific symptoms and signs of testosterone deficiency in men, 
This is incomplete or delayed sexual development, loss of axillary or pubic hair, and very small testes, which is less than 6 ml on measuring with the orchidometer. In terms of presentation, uh, based on the onset, time of the onset, if it is present, uh, if the onset is on the fetal life, uh, there will be sexual differentiation disorders, example, female external genitalia, hyperspedias, late in the form of micropenis or cryptochidism. If the onset is pre-pubertal, then there will be delayed puberty or there will be no appearance of secondary sexual characteristics. There will be presence of a high-pitched voice, enochoid body habitus, which is uh, disproportionate limb length. If the presentation is post-pubertal, symptoms usually include deficient body hair, low libido, loss of morning erections, hot flushes, gynecomastia, infertility, height loss, and unexplained anemia. Non-specific symptoms may include erectile dysfunction, low muscle mass, fatigue, and depression. As regards specific conditions, some pointers regard client flinter syndrome. Boys usually enter puberty before Leydig cell failure, but may experience infertility and androgen deficiency later. In terms of CHH or congenital hypogonadotropic hypogonadism, boys develop male external genitalia, but can experience cryptochidism or micropenis. If you are talking about Y chromosomal microdeletions, this will result in small testes and infertility, but with normal testosterone and LH levels. If you are talking about a syndrome called Pasculani syndrome, men with post-pubertal testicular volume and some spermatogenesis, but low serum testosterone. So these are some other clinical pointers which can point us towards a specific conditions. And this has been mentioned, all these things in the recent Lancet review. What are the other clinical indicators? If there is a history of testicular trauma, surgery or mumps, this may suggest primary hypogonadism. Anosmia may suggest Kalman syndrome, which will be indicative of congenital hypogonadotropic hypogonadism. If there is a family history, like a pedigree chart and family history can help diagnose congenital hypogonadism, X-linked recessive inheritance may indicate an ANOS1 mutation in this regards. What about systemic illnesses and malnutrition, like severe illnesses, malnutrition, and obesity can cause reversible suppression of the hypothalamus pituitary axis, or especially obesity can cause what we refer to as the functional hypogonadism. Drug-induced hypogonadism can be caused by certain medications which can cause increase in the prolactin or by uh, hyperprolactinemia due to any other cause. Uh, it can also be caused by certain medications. The hypogonadism can be caused by certain medications like glucocorticoids, opioids, and androgen abuse. Again, these are rising uh, number of cases which we see in our clinical practice, secondary to opioid use and androgen abuse, leading to functional hypogonadism. And it is also important, uh, important to assess if the patient was unintentionally exposed to some androgen in the form of some supplements which he must have taken over the counter. So these are all the clinical indicators or the history which we need to gather from the patient to try and help us point out towards the cause of the hypogonadism. So in our patient, we had a total, total testosterone level which was measured on two separate occasions. Again, this was done in the morning and in the fasting state. So we'll look at specifically what the guidelines suggest for testosterone me measurement. So we had two samples, which were both low, 250 and 255, uh, with the normal range between 270 to 800 nanogram per deciliter. LH and FSH were appearing normal. As regards testosterone measurement about the guidelines, clearly suggest that because it has a significant diurnal variation throughout the day, it is best to measure it in the morning time, preferably between 7 to 10 a.m. You should do a fasting sample as the food can suppress testosterone concentrations. Make sure that the patient is not having any acute illness ongoing. Make sure the patient is not sleep deprived because sleep depression can also suppress the testosterone. And make sure that you use, you use a certified and a reliable and accurate essay, which is CDC certified uh, in this regards. What about LH and uh, FSH? They can be affected by biotin. So make sure that if the patient is on any biotin supplements to stop it 72 hours prior to testing for LH and FSH. Again, increasing number of people are on biotin supplements for uh, over-the-counter products for hair loss. Uh, his SSBC or uh, sex hormone binding globulin was done, which was found out to be low. So now we are thinking about conditions which may be associated with decreased SSBG and in which it is mandatory 
and clinical practice to try and measure free testosterone concentrations. So conditions in which measurement of free testosterone concentration is recommended. Uh, the top condition is the conditions which has decreased SHBG. These are obesity, diabetes mellitus, both of them which we commonly encounter in our clinical practice, use of glucocorticoids, some progestins or an anabolic steroids or androgenic steroids, nephrotic syndrome, hypothyroidism, acromegaly, polymorphisms in the SSBG gene. All these conditions may be associated with decreased SSBG and then that will bring down the total testosterone. However, in these conditions, the free testosterone may be normal and that is what we need to assess. And in the conditions, uh, further conditions which are associated with increased SSBG, which may cause a falsely high level for the total testosterone. Again, in this case, measurement of free testosterone is recommended. This is happens with aging, HIV disease, cirrhosis, hepatitis, hyperthyroidism, hypothyroidism and the opposite thing, use of some anticonvulsants, use of estrogens and polymorphisms in SSBG gene. Again, free testosterone measurement is recommended if total testosterone concentrations appear to be in the borderline zone around the lower limit of the normal range, which is around 200 to 400 nanogram per deciliter. So these are some important conditions which we should know for our exams and clinical practice. So what was the calculated free testosterone in this patient? It was low. Uh, it was in the normal range. It was 100 picogram per ml. It was uh, the, the normal range between 50 to 200 picogram per ml. So clearly we have now an obese male. Uh, which has low SSBG, which has low total testosterone, but a normal free testosterone. So this is what we'll refer to as pseudo-hypogonadism or functional hypogonadism in terms of the cause for the hypogonadism. So obesity and comorbidities seem to account for much of the decreasing testosterone in the men. Low testosterone in the men with obesity is attributable to the decrease in SSBG, which happens. Men with low total testosterone solely due to low SSBG are eugonadal and their free serum testosterone concentration is normal. And that's why the terminology of pseudo hypogonadism has been mentioned in the recent Lancet review. So this is a good approach, which is given in the endocrine society guidelines. First, we should look at the history and physical examination. We looked at all the pointers and the history we need to gather for this patient. We already looked at in the previous slide. So this part is easy now. Evaluate for systemic illnesses, drugs, nutritional deficiency, measure morning and fasting total testosterone. So again, it is confirmed by doing two samples. Then if we have a low total testosterone plus low free testosterone, then that the diagnosis of hypogonadism is confirmed. On the other hand, if we have like in our scenario, normal uh, free testosterone, but a low total testosterone, then we should consider other causes of symptoms and signs, look for pseudo-hypogonadism and the functional hypogonadism. So if the diagnosis of hypogonadism is confirmed with low total testosterone and low free testosterone, then we measure the LH and FSH. So that is how we'll be differentiating between primary and secondary hypogonadism. In primary, LH and FSH will be high. So proceed to obtain karyotype to diagnose Klinefelter syndrome, if clinical indication, if the LH and FSH appear to be normal or inappropriately normal, that, we, that is what the correct terminology for it, or low, then this is called secondary hypogonadism. So in this case scenario, we measure two important things. We do prolactin because uh, many times we have hyperprolactin image secondary to an adenoma, which will be the cause for the same. And that's why we do a pituitary MRI. We also do the iron studies because hemochromatosis may have a similar presentation. So uh, iron saturation as well. So this is the important steps in the guidelines, which is clearly mentioned. So now looking at the causes uh, in this table, primary and secondary, we'll look at the organic causes first. So for the primary hypogonadism, we have Kalman syndrome, we have cryptochidism, myotonic dystrophy, anarchia. Sometimes of cancer chemotherapy can cause testicular irradiation damage, or chidectomy, or chitis, testicular trauma, torsion, and advanced age. All these are causes of organic primary hypogonadism. Now, looking at causes of organic secondary hypogonadism, hypothalamic and pituitary more straightforward iron overload syndromes like hemochromatosis, infiltrative or destructive diseases of the hypothalamus or pituitary, and idiopathic hypogonadotropic hypogonadism. When we talk about Functional causes of primary hypogonadism, we are talking about medications, which are androgen synthesis inhibitors, or patients with end-stage renal disease. 
On the other hand, when we talk about functional causes of secondary hypogonadism, these are hyperprolactinemia, opioids, uh, anabolic steroid use, glucocorticoids, very common, all of these in clinical practice, then alcohol and marijuana abuse, systemic illnesses, nutritional deficiency or excessive exercise. Again, many times we see athletes, uh, runners presenting with this and presenting with amenorrhea, secondary hypogonadism, especially females. Uh, severe obesity, some sleep disorders, organ failure like liver, heart, and lung, and comorbid illnesses associated with aging. So these are all causes of functional hypogonadism, uh, primary and secondary. Uh, so if you were to look at all the scenario, ideally MRI pituitary was not needed in our patient, but MRI pituitary was done and it was found to be normal. Iron studies were also found to be normal. So a routine MRI for cellular mass is in secondary hypogonadism has a low yield. This is what is mentioned in the guidelines. So role of MRI should be ex to exclude pituitary and or hypothalamic tumor or infiltrative disease. When we have evidence of severe hypogonadism, here we are talking about serum total testosterone levels of less than 5.2 nanomole per liter or less than 150 nanogram per deciliter. If we encounter this value of especially for less than 5 nanomole per liter, we should definitely go for an MRI. Then if there is evidence of panhypopituitarism, evidence of other hormonal deficiencies, persistent hyperprolactinemia, or symptoms or signs of a tumor mass effect, such as new onset headache, visual impairments, or visual field defects are present. So these are the specific indications for pituitary imaging in our case scenario. If it was present, uh, then we should proceed with the MRI. So this is as per the guidelines. So if you look at the whole case summary so far, as per section one, we now have a diagnosis of functional hypogonadism or pseudohypogonadism in context of obesity and type 2 diabetes. And there is no obvious pituitary pathology. And of course, the iron studies were normal as well. Now moving on to section two and our case number two will be in the next slide. So this will deal with the treatment of hypogonadism with testosterone. But to get access to the full session, please subscribe to my lecture series, which will give you access to the existing 82 lectures, which are already on my YouTube channel, plus all the upcoming new videos lifelong. So just email me on my email ID, which is mazirules at gmail.com and WhatsApp me on my number, which is mentioned on the screen. Uh, in the second sp uh, the part of the session, we'll be doing the section two, which is treatments for hypogonadism with testosterone, looking at different formulations for testosterone replacement and the pros and cons. And the last section, we'll be doing another case for monitoring on testosterone therapy. What are the uh, monitoring criteria which we'll be using while the patient is on testosterone replacement and uh, uh, looking at the complications which we should be alerted of. So thank you so much. Hope you enjoyed the session. Uh, see you with the next session very, very soon.